M friends. Here's the fully 3D printed AMX50 that I've been working on for the past few weeks. It's my test bed for a totally over the top post shading to see how much of the effect is gonna be visible on the finished model. Well, last week it got toned down a notch with washes and chipping, but the real deal comes tonight. Earth effects and heavy layers of autumn mud. I'm gonna start with the lower hull and running gear because it's the best starting point. And it has a very loose fit, so it'll be better to get it super glued sooner than later. I'll try this dark muddy paste from AK because it has nice color for this kind of setting. Normally I wouldn't care for the color because a textured paste is therefore, you guessed it, texture. And I don't mind repainting it completely. But here I thought it could be used to make the process quicker. And it definitely would. However, as the name suggests, it's supposed to replicate wet ground, not dark, damp ground. Because of this, it dries to a completely glossy finish. Working as advertised, I guess, but I should have known better when I was buying it. The thing even leaves a glossy, watery residue if you blend it. No worries though, I'll fix it in no time. But first, let's enhance the texture with some loose scatter. There's of course the obligatory and my personal favorite, dried sea ball. And by the way, AK is actually selling those as well. <laughs> but also birch seeds. You know, those little buggers that hang off birches in autumn. I fixed everything with VMS Ballast Freeze, a strong acrylic binder that won't get attacked by mineral spirits. This glue has a bit of body though, so I always move it around with a brush and some tap water, and when everything seems A-OK, -okay, I carefully soak up and remove the excess. To further blend the natural debris, I gave it one more gentle pass with the textured mud, and it actually creates a pretty sweet effect considering it's just a textured paste. And while the stuff is still wet, why not add even one more extra layer of texture, huh? This time with leaf scatter, a bunch of dried up leaves chopped up in one of those, you know, kitchen food processors. Okay, so now it's time to deal with the shiny finish. Luckily, VMS flat varnish, well, I've said it multiple times in the past, but I'll keep saying it, it's a magic potion. The easiest varnish I ever worked with, and it always dries to a completely flat, smooth finish without any, you know, unwanted side effects. A super glossy surface like this might need a couple of layers, but in the end, it works like a dream. Let's not waste too much time and post shade the muddy texture. Yup, that's right, <laughs> not paint all over it, but post shade. Because the color is really good, I just didn't want to give it my usual cover it all up with Tamiya paint treatment, instead I focused the light earth color in the middle of the lower hull where dry layers of earth would be present. And because very little of this will be visible on the finished model, it could be left like this and I think it wouldn't be too much of an issue. But on the other hand, a lower hull is the perfect place to practice and maybe try new methods or just get a good grip on the technique. So let's hit it with enamels. I'm actually gonna use the same paints as on my Yak Panther from last year, but you'll see how the underlying texture and different intensities can create a totally different result even if the tools, aka paints, are the same. Even though I'm going for a relatively muddy finish and a dry earth tone was already applied with an airbrush, I still like to use either dry step or, in this case, dry earth from the ammo splashes range. It simply creates a very good foundation for every upcoming effect and it ensures everything dries to a flat finish. In other words, it makes any other enamel paint more predictable and controllable. Working with the so-called wet blending method makes the entire process relatively easy and fast, but most importantly, leads to pretty nice results. Basically, in other cases, you'd need to wait for the previous layer of paint to fully dry before you start applying and blending the next one, but with this approach, the paints do the blending for you. Of course, finer effects such as these streaks of moisture are better painted over a dry surface, and here I like to work with a relatively thick and opaque paint, and it's also a regular dark enamel wash. Yeah, but it works. <laughs> So here's the finished lower hull, and once again, it hurts me to hide all of this in the shadow of tracks and wheels, but hey, at least it's caught on video. Moving on to a more visible part, the wheels. 
Here is the exact same thing, just the amount of effects is more limited. Of course, it's fine to cover the entire running gear with a thick layer of mud if that's your goal. It was kinda my goal as well, but I'd feel bad for all the paints and effects underneath. So, personally, I always like to keep some of the underlying paint job and chipping and pin washes visible. I used the same textured base on the tracks, and here it's okay to cover most of the outer surfaces with the muddy paste and natural scatter. The only exception is the protruding contact points. These usually get polished to a high sheen, but there are of course exceptions. They're probably the easiest to weather because they just get completely covered with mud, but because tracks are more visible than the lower hull, I kinda like to treat them later down the road after I have a good grip of what I'm actually trying to achieve. And while the outer contact points look good in a bright shiny finish, the inner sides here I still trust the good old pencil, or a graphite stick if you want to feel artsier. Now I could finally assemble the entire running gear together. Good riddance, because every time I took the model out of this Octopus M2M painting stand, the wheels would just fall off. Their loose fit also meant I had to pay close attention to their geometry, because otherwise my mistakes would haunt me forever, manifesting as wobbly wheels on a French tank. Okay, I'll get back to this part with a few final adjustments, but what we've got here already sets a nice precedent for the rest of the tank, so let's now play around with that. The upper surfaces might seem like it would be the same exact schlock all over again, and it technically is, but it actually isn't. Even if your tank's tracks are protruding and they'd splash the hull with mud, the amount and placement should follow their movement. Other areas, such as the glazes plate, can also collect large quantities of mud from the tank, smashing into the uneven terrain. When it comes to horizontal surfaces, I like to use real dirt and natural scatter. I just find it more controllable than the mud paste, and it's also harder to overdo the effect. After giving the mud and debris a localized flat finish, I could proceed with pre-dusting. This method works flawlessly for blending the thick and often not so pretty accumulations of mud with the cleaner surfaces. But it's not just about that, it also lays down the foundation for enamel weathering. Brush applied earth effects might be sometimes too translucent for our needs, and when you need a solid, opaque layer of dirt, airbrushed acrylic paint is the way to go. It also makes the overall workflow faster, because if the pre-dusting is done with care, it can actually look pretty neat on its own. I was actually really happy with the results on this one, but sadly it wouldn't be enough because of the whole heavy mud thing. It's also possible to add contrast between panels, with or without masking. And here comes the fun part, but also not. <laughs> the not part is because I generally don't enjoy this process too much. It's actually one of my least favorite techniques on models. Uh, but the fun part, well, this is the true test for how the heavy post shading will hold up against weathering effects. This area is also a good candidate for some speckling treatment, because we all love that extra gritty texture. Splashes paints from ammo are also good because they're kinda hard to remove after about 15 minutes, so whenever you don't want to use the wet blending method anymore, you don't have to wait an entire day before piling another layer on top of them. Even if the tank is gonna be completely muddy, combining dry and damp tones is important. It might not look like that in real life all the time, but it does add some authenticity and lots of interesting effects, if that makes any sense. Painting over loose debris is a lot of fun, because the pre-dusted layer guides your dry earth tones, while the individual clumps of earth are a roadmap for the darker effects. In other cases, mostly over smooth areas where nothing special is really going on, wet blending might be more efficient. Not to mention it also leads to slightly different effects and thus adds variety to the model. So that puts the dirty work out of the way. Most of the effects are in place, and at this point it's also easier to imagine the finished result, so... Let's now go over the model with a more controlled approach. Another round of pin wash is essential around panels with deep gaps. Earth tones naturally flow into these crevices, but in real life there'd be a deep shadow instead, so there's nothing bad about going back and forth with some techniques. 
While I had this oil painted hand, I focused on the exhausts. These are pretty unusual in shape, but it's a good opportunity to be creative. I created the effect with multiple passes of very diluted paint, you know, slowly building up the opacity, and then the exhaust themselves were quickly treated with an airbrush and a flat black acrylic paint. And now it's time for the most important step in the muddying process. With a mixture of earth, dark wash and some enamel gloss, I add spots of the darkest mud. It always makes the tracks more visually interesting when it's applied towards their center. It also adds a nice gradient towards the bottom of the tank, sort of, you know, working in conjunction with the post shading. <laughs> the inner links can look rather boring, but selectively applying this mixture will distinguish them from one another. The effect becomes less evident once the paint dries, so it can be used all over the tank. Just like on the lower hull, fine, sharp, streaking effects are easier to paint with a thicker mixture. I like to use this long synthetic liner brush from Ammo because it holds a fine tip, but it's also long enough to hold large quantities of paint. And the higher I go, the smaller the amount. On the turret roof, for example, I only used the mud to add contrast between components and individual steel plates. Another fancy technique that works in conjunction with earth tones is oily, grimy or fuely stains. <laughs> I already marked out these areas with post shading, so the process is actually very straightforward. I also added those to a few wheels, just to make them more visually interesting. It's better to keep it random and rather limited, because that's what makes it more eye-catching. And because the model was pretty much 95% finished at this point, I went ahead and added the final effect with a graphite stick. Polishing worn edges gives the model a metallic look, making it look heavier. Graphite has the strongest bite over a completely flat finish, and although the model was initially sealed with a satin varnish, all the subsequent weathering layers gave it a flatter look, thus making it more graphite friendly. <laughs> it also does wonders on blackened steel surfaces such as the machine gun, which was originally base coated with grey paint and given a generous blackish brown wash beforehand. The last edition was antennas made from a 0.3mm copper wire, and I quickly painted them in a neutral grey color. Well, my friends, that makes this tank pretty much finished. It was a nice change of pace to go for a heavily weathered finish because I haven't done a tank completely plastered with mud in a while. Painting a 3D printed kit is actually the same thing as any other model, but you sort of got to accept it for what it is. You know, there will be some visible print layers, so unless you want to spend hours and hours cleaning them, it's better to just embrace the layering and go with the flow. This model was also a test bed for a more radical post shading, and looking at it now, I think it got toned down to a... not, I'd say, a reasonable level. I can make some adjustments to the method on my next models, but for a test where I didn't know what to expect, I think it isn't too bad. What do you think? And because this model was more of an experiment and a little passion project of mine, it already kind of fulfilled its purpose, although I still have an unpainted figure for it, and a small part of me wants to make a very simple scenic base. But the size of the tank kinda puts me off, especially the super long gun barrel. Barrels protruding from bases are not very pretty in my opinion, and I don't want to make a huge empty base because of that, so I'm a bit conflicted. Anyway, I hope you found this video helpful or at the very least interesting to watch my friends, and thank you for watching! I must give an honorable shout out to my wonderful patrons who make this weekly show possible because we had some interesting, constructive conversations about this model over there. My Patreon is like a magazine or a blog subscription, so you could gain access to frequent, almost daily updates from me. We could discuss things in the comments, through DMs and emails. Um, if you decide to support me there, you could also gain access to one week early ad-free videos, so you could watch the next one right now, or in case I decide to give up on this model, there might be a Patreon Q&A video. 
and I'm also posting these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. There are also reference pictures and ideas for dioramas and scenic bases and 3D files for your printing pleasure. Stuff like accessories for tanks or dioramas. Anyway, that's gonna be it for tonight, my friends. So I'm gonna think about what to do with this finished model or if I should start building another one. But in the meantime, you stay safe, stay awesome, keep building those models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!